Hello to all of our Macedonia family and to all those who might be watching and listening. Just want to give you a couple of announcements before we enter into worship today. First, we want to remind you to continue to get out and vote. We're coming up at the end of our season of election, and we want you all to exercise your right and vote as we continue to move forward as a nation. At this point in time, there are two options. You can either go and vote in person, or if you have received a mail-in ballot, we advise that you drop your ballot off in person. It's too late at this point to mail in your ballot in time for the election. Also, we wanted to let you know that our food drop at Macedonia Baptist Church will be held Thursday, November 5th, 2020 at 9 a.m. For those who need food during this time, particularly as we get into our fall and moving forward into winter season, this is an opportunity for you to get food. So please spread the word. It'll be a safe environment. There'll be no need to enter into the church building and people will be waiting outside for you so that they can drop off pre-packaged boxes at our food drop. Lastly, we want to remind you all that you all need to continue to pray for our sick and shut-in members. Call, check up on them so that they will know the love of Christ through each and every one of you. Lastly, we want you to continue thinking about and praying about and supporting our ministry through ministry gifts. So if you find it in your heart to give to our ministry, we greatly appreciate and love you. Always remember that there are three ways you can give here at Macedonia. You can give via Givelify. You can also give via Cash App. And if you so desire, you can always mail any contributions you might have to our P.O. Box. Again, we always thank you and appreciate whatever you move on your heart to give. Now, let's move on into worship. Your 
thank our music ministry uh, for giving us a moment of worship before we get into the Word of God. Uh, I know that this particular Sunday would have been our men's day, and so I send a, a special shout out to all of the brothers and men of Macedonia Baptist Church. Uh, it's such an honor to be your spiritual covering and to think and care for you in these times. And so I'm, I'm excited to know that there are mighty men of God who are a part of our ministry. Let's begin with a word of prayer and we'll dive into what God would have to say to us today. God, we come now asking that we have open hearts to hear what thus saith the Lord. Guide us as only you will. Speak, O Lord, as only you can. Let it be nourishment to our souls and let it be marrow to our bones. This we ask in the precious, mighty name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. I sit today um, as Jesus would have or as any of the near, ancient Near Eastern rabbinic teachers would have sat uh, to have a conversation that God has pressed on my heart to have. It's been in my spirit for a while, and I believe that there is a word from the Lord for us to think and ponder through today. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, um, there is a passage of scripture that is found in the, by the prophet Ezekiel chapter 24. Ezekiel chapter 24, uh, God's word begins at verse 15. Here is what God's word says. The word of the Lord came to me, Mortal, with one blow I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Yet you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh, but not aloud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban and put your sandals on your feet. Do not cover 
your upper lip or eat the bread of mourners. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at evening, my wife died. And on the next morning, I did as I was commanded. Then the people said to me, will you not tell us what these things mean for us, that you are acting this way? Then I said to them, the word of the Lord came to me, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the delight of your eyes and your heart's desire and your sons and your daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword and you shall do as I have done. You shall not cover up your lip or eat the bread of mourners. Your turban shall be on your heads and your sandals on your feet, and you shall not mourn or weep, but you shall pine away in your iniquities and groan to one another. Thus Ezekiel shall be assigned to you. You shall do just as he has done. When this comes, then you shall know that I am the Lord God. And you mortal, on the day when I take from them their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes and their heart's affection, and also their sons and their daughters, on that day, one who has escaped will come to you to report to you the news. On that day, your mouth shall be open to the one who has escaped, and you shall speak and no longer be silent. So you shall be assigned to them. And they shall know that I am the Lord, their God. The word of God is blessed. I want to have a conversation today from this topic, what a grief. What a grief. There's an article from CNBC that came out a couple of weeks ago that suggested that seven in ten Gen Zers have reported symptoms of depression during the pandemic. The hardest hit by this pandemic mentally and emotionally seem to be people who are in the ages of 18 to 23. According to the survey that was done by the American Psychological Association. And I'm sure that many of us Now that we are on the first day of November, have felt the weight and the toll of this pandemic. And to make matters worse, the psychological strain has been one where we feel as though that we have lost control and have lost so much. (sighs) To make matters worse, just when we thought we were getting a handle on things, just about every country, excuse me, every state in our country has reported surges of more cases. And consequently, the response spiritually you look at it in totality is really a response that is known as grief. Grief in its simplest terms is any kind of humane response to loss. And losing seems to be the circumstance of the day. That actually, in fact, my brothers and sisters, is the context of our scripture. The prophet that God speaks to is named Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is a prophet that lives and ministers during the time of Israel's captivity in Babylon. What would happen in the ancient Near East, conquering nations and empires would take the best and the brightest minds and persons of a annexed nation, forcibly remove them from that nation. 
politicians, government leaders, philosophers, merchants, artisans, and even priests were removed from that conquered nation and taken by that conquering empire. The logic was that by cutting off the head of a nation, you never had to worry about any insurrection from the remnant that stayed. And Ezekiel, being a part and growing up in the priestly class of Israel's society, was, one, was a part of one of the first groups of Judah that was moved and forcibly migrated to Babylonian captivity. And he has to minister when once he was a high priest in Israel, must now be subjugated to peasantry in Babylon. Ezekiel's prophecy, most scholars suggest, or otherworldly. He is eccentric, and some of his visions arguably have even been described as pornographic. He has these dreamlike trances where he journeys off into otherworldly places, and sometimes he is drifted off so violently. Some scholars suggest that Ezekiel, during these moments of prophecies and trance dreams, was most likely on some type of hallucinogenic trip. Others suggest the fact that he might have just simply gone mad or might have had a mental illness of paranoid schizophrenia. But what is clear is that Ezekiel is a man who was forcibly removed from his home after he witnesses and hears of the destruction and desolation of his home. And what all scholars who study the historical and biblical nature of this text have all agreed upon is that Ezekiel is a man who has been traumatized. That the ever impending events of his life have left him with severe trauma. We look at the context of our scripture, we see another tragic and terrible moment in what has already been a traumatic experience. God tells him, the 15th verse, the 24th chapter of the prophecies of Ezekiel, that he is getting ready to lose the most precious and treasured thing that he has in his life. I don't know when I first began to read this, this passage of scripture, I, I couldn't imagine what God could have ever taken away from Ezekiel that already had not been taken away. He's lost his job. He's lost his home. He's lost his tribe. He's lost his nation. And is in peasantry as a priest. What more does he have to lose? And God allows for Ezekiel to lose his bride. I don't know what that's like to lose your rib. I, I can't imagine the pain of losing a loved one who he had so dear and close. Traditionally, in Israel, there was a customary way in which one would grieve and lament in times of pain and suffering. They would stop wearing their normal headdress that was customary in their tradition. They would stop wearing sandals. They would cover up their face, and that is part of the text here where the Bible talks about covering the upper lip, they would cover up a part of their face. They sometimes in the immediate nature and the impact of losing or having something traumatic happen to them, they would rip their clothes open as a sign of pain, anger, 
and rage. Most scholars suggest the fact that the idea behind these acts of grieving was in order to protect the living from the netherworld as a way of understanding the, the barrier between life and death. There is a notion that there is something that connects the two. And so the people of Israel would perform these customary grieving tasks as a way of protecting them from the netherworld. And when loss, pain, and trauma came to an Israelite's life, they would assume a posture of grief. They would take the time to separate from everything and process through their pain. But Ezekiel tells, God tells Ezekiel, this isn't normal. And you will not be able to grieve normally. And I would suggest, my brothers and sisters, that everything about what we're dealing with in this time, in this moment, in our history and life is not normal. And that includes our grieving. There has been so much pain that has been experienced in these past several months that some of us never would have imagined happening all at the same time. People have had to say, I love you, over a camera phone. People have had to offer final goodbyes through plexiglass. People have had to offer elbows instead of warm embraces. People have completely lost every aspect of their life. Eight million people, eight million new people, might I add, are now homeless. Our unemployment rate is still going up. And we don't even know what is going to happen after November the 4th. There is so much pain and so much trauma that we have experienced. And it is clear that it's taken a toll. I read a report from Bloomberg just earlier this past week about uh, the country of Melbourne, the city and area of Melbourne, Australia, that had one of the strictest COVID-19 uh, lock-ins and shutdowns throughout the entire world. For three months straight, everybody was strictly supposed to stay in, in the house, no jobs, no commerce, no activity, in isolation. And they just opened up after three months of living in a mental and psychological lockdown. They said in, this, in, this, in the article that alcohol consumption went up 20%. They said that family domestic violence went up by 7%. This pandemic is taking a toll and people are coping, but they're still hurting. And because of the pandemic, we can't even cope and grieve like we normally would. And my fear is my brothers and sisters is that there are people who are listening, who are watching, who you know who have all of this bottled up thoughts and emotions and pains on the inside. And you are just like Ezekiel. You are in a place where you can't grieve properly. And God told me to tell you that it is not divine will or God's desire 
for you to bottle all that on the inside of you. Especially, let me, let me especially talk to the brothers. This is supposed to be men's day. So let me, let me give a special message to the brothers who have learned through our American culture a toxic masculinity that proves and that tells us that we aren't supposed to cry, that we aren't supposed to shed and express emotion, that we are supposed to bottle that stuff up inside. That is not God's will. And I bind that spirit of mental sabotage and spiritual decay. That you are no less of a man for the tears that you have shed. You are no less of a man because you wail and moan and cry. You are no less of a man for expressing your emotion. Matter of fact, you might feel a little better if you did. Because there is no way that you can be a real man have experienced the kind of loss that people have experienced in this time and not express it. And maybe that's why there's so much domestic violence. Maybe that's why some of our men have become predators instead of priests because they got emotions built up on the inside that they won't tap into. Maybe that's why you can't connect in your relationships. Because in order to have an authentic relationship, you have to express your emotion. And one of the moments where emotion is needed is in the grieving process. And God's word proves that coping without expression, without tears, without moaning or wailing, without actually validating the pain that you feel is really what, not, was what God does not want. God tells Ezekiel, you can't, do, you can't do what is normal. It was normal in Israel for a man to take time away from everything when he has felt pain and sorrow and trauma. It's not normal and it's not healthy to bottle all that stuff on the inside of you. You are killing yourself. And I bind that spirit that makes us think that we have to be all shell and no soul. That is not God's will for your life. And God tells Ezekiel that you can't do what is normal, which is expressing your emotions. And I want to challenge you today to take the leap of faith and to process your grief, process your pain, process your trauma. Some of us don't respect women because we never dealt with the pain we had against our mothers. Some of us don't know how to have healthy relationships because we never truly got over the last relationship we had. And you bring your emotional baggage that you never dealt with in your past relationship into the new one. And then you're upset because you're making the new relationship pay for old hurts. James chapter 2 says, faith without works is dead. And if you believe that God is truly a healer, then sometimes it requires us to do the work. So find you a therapist or a counselor. I, I'm your pastor and I'm here to be with you. I'm here to pray with you. But I'm here to tell you, I'm only one man. And I am not a trained psychological listener. I am trained to be a spiritual director. And as your pastor, I am pointing you to go find some real professional help. You are no less of a man. You are no less of a person. Because you go see professional help. If you want your car to drive smoothly, you take it to the dealership to get your oil change. If the car was dirty, you take it to the car wash and get the dirt off. 
And some of us got dirt on our souls, on our minds, on our hearts, and we don't have anybody that we go to to clean some of that mess off. Go see a therapist. Go find a counselor. And find somebody that can work on that inside. You're no less of a Christian. You don't have any less faith because you pray and go see a therapist. But if you are in pain, work on it. I want to, I'm serious about this. On the bottom of your screen, you're going to find some, some numbers that you can call. That if you are in need of help, if you just need someone to talk to, there are resources out there. The National Helpline, for those who need help with mental or emotional issues, is 1-800-663-HELP. 1-800-663-4357. The National Suicide Helpline is 1-800-273-8255. For those of us who might be in the Baltimore region, there is a Baltimore Crisis Response Hotline as well, 410-443-5175. For those who might not necessarily need immediate help, the Baltimore Behavioral Health Number is 410-637-1900. Dial the number one when you get a response. There are also ministries that also specialize and help in these areas of ministry. One that I particularly and personally know is the Hope Center of Carmody Hills. If you are so inclined to be a part or seek uh, some type of therapy or counseling, and you want somewhat of a Christian environment by which you can find it in, their number is 240-719. 2699. Again, 240-719-2699. It is imperative to understand that God's will is that when you experience pain, that you work through it and not avoid it or ball it up in a hole. But not only does Ezekiel's, gospel, Ezekiel's scripture show us that there is individual grief, but my brothers and sisters, the word also shows us that there is collective grief. That grief is not just something that happens on an individual level. Grief is also something that can happen on a collective level. Ezekiel gets word that not only is something precious going to be lost of his personal life, but he also gets word that there is something that will that the people of Israel are going to lose. And what they lose is the heart and soul of their entire culture. Ezekiel hears from God and God says, my temple will be destroyed. The pride and joy of all of Israel was the temple, the temple that David wanted to build, but because of his sin, could not build, and his son, King Solomon, builds. Solomon's temple. That, that's the temple that they have so much joy. The temple is the heart of their city. It's the heart of their nation. The temple is, is believed to be, in Israelite theology, to believe, believe to be the place where God dwelled, that God rests in the temple. And God tells Ezekiel, it's gone. It's gone. That's the metaphor. That's the analogy. That Ezekiel losing his wife is like the people of Israel losing their temple. It meant that much to them. In this captivity, the temple is gone. And the only solace, the only grace that God gives is knowing that in the times that we're in, you're not alone. 
that you're not the only person who has lost a loved one. You're not the only person who's lost their job. You're not the only person who's struggling to pay bills. You're not the only person who was waiting on another stimulus check. You're not the only person that is dealing with this trauma. That's why the Bible says, do not forsake the assemblies of the saints. I, I, I couldn't imagine if I was somebody who did not have a church family that they could rely on and lean on in times such as these. This is what church was all about to begin with. It's not about whose anniversary it is. It's not about who's leading with ministry, but when hell has come our way and when trauma has struck everybody, it is community. It's the beloved community, as Dr. King puts it. That is the grace that God gives us. But we got to change our theology now, just like the people of Israel have to wrestle with the theology. Where can we find God now? when we have no temple to go to. And my brothers and my sisters, let me teach you that the church is not the building. The church is not these steeples. It's not the organ. It's not the pews. It's not the pulpit. The church is you and me. We are the church. We're the church when we're on the phone together. We're, we're the church when we Zoom together. We're, we're the church when we check up on each other. We're the church when we have Bible study. We're the church when we have prayer call. We are the church. And we have each other in moments like these. And that's why we have to change our theology to recognize that we're in this together. You'll find out who's really a part of your ministry right now. You'll find out who's really in it with you right now. And we are not alone. This is what the church was built for to support and lift up one another. And the spirit by which we are doing that right now, it better be the same way when you come back. That when we come back into this place, who cares what your seat is? When we come back into this place, who cares what your title is? Because when we weren't in here, none of that stuff mattered anymore. This ought to be a place that was just as supportive during the pandemic as it is after. Because we aren't alone. And we all have had to experience the same trauma. Ezekiel hears word from God. He loses something precious and that Israel loses something precious. But what I love about God is that God never leaves us with a cliffhanger. God tells Ezekiel that somebody is going to escape captivity. Now, I, 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 should, I should stop right there. And if, and if I had time, if I was in a different Spirit, and if this was a different kind of message, I could talk about the escaped nature of captivity. And I could talk about how some of, some of us have escaped and we never shared what was going on back in Judah. And God tells Ezekiel that somebody's going to come and tell you when the temple falls. And when that happens... Then you can speak. Who and, and, and y'all, that, that makes me excited because if the prophet gets licensed from God to speak, that means God is still working. That means that, that this is not going to last, that there is still a word from God that we have yet to receive. 
that there is still a message, that there is still something coming down the pike that we don't even know about. And, and, and that's why it's okay to cry. It's okay to lament. It's okay to shed your tears. It's okay to see a therapist. It's okay to talk with friends. It's okay to get with family. But after you've done all that, make sure you give God some praise and some worship that because you're still here, it means God still use you. That means God still needs you. That means there is still yet more to come. This won't last always. And so it is in chapter 24 that Ezekiel gets word that the temple was going to fall. But if you continue reading the book of Ezekiel, you'll find out that by chapter 34, Ezekiel gets a word from God that says that, that there will be a good shepherd that is going to come and is going to take care of us. It's in chapter 36 that Ezekiel prophesies that the exiles, those who have been removed, whose hearts have been turned to stone, will become hearts of flesh again. And they will get a new spirit when they come back. And that's my prayer too. My, my prayer is that, that we become a chapter 36 kind of church, that, that we have a new spirit when we come back in here, that, that we aren't the same the way we left is the way we're going to come back. Because you've dealt with your trauma. You dealt with that church hurt that you still haven't dealt with 30 years ago. You've forgiven some folk who might have hurt you and damaged you and you took it out on us, on us as a church family. That's, that, that, that's my prayer. And then, whew, everybody knows Ezekiel chapter 37. Can these bones live again? And so God doesn't stop talking to Ezekiel in chapter 24. But God still got more to say. And every day that you get up and breathe, in the middle of a pandemic that affects your respiratory system is a proof that God still got something more to say. And that this trouble, this trauma won't last always. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know how this pandemic has affected you. But I give you hope to know that it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to not get help. That you're not in this alone and that trouble don't last always and God has not finished yet. Maybe you are somebody who does not even know Jesus in the pardoning of your sins. We offer Christ to you now that if you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are saved. Jesus can handle your trauma and Jesus can deliver you from it as well. My brothers and sisters, we need the spirit of Christ like never before. So I leave you with a prayer. God, we're not okay. This has been such a tough year. And we just need space to process where we are. God, I ask that whoever might be watching, watching or listening, that you would give them a spirit of healing in the name of Jesus, that you would heal the wounds that doesn't show up on any kind of test. But the pains that they feel, the trauma that they experience, the grief that they have on the inside. We pray this in the matchless name 
of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. My brothers and sisters, always remember, God loves you. So do I. We'll see you soon.